Thank you for attending our NetBees and Cisco co-hosted webinar with Loudoun County Public Schools, um, learning how to help school districts pivot to the new normal. So we're going to introduce our panelists. We have Mitch here from Loudoun County Public Schools, and I think he literally is at school or in the office again. So I'll let everyone introduce themselves after this. Uh, Saravanan from Cisco and then Greg from NetBees. And Greg, I will let you take it away. All right, thanks, Jessica. And uh, apologies to anyone if you hear fire trucks in the background or the dogs barking at them. Here in California, yes, we're pivoting to the new normal, red skies and fires. Uh, we have a really great uh, webinar about a very remarkable uh, public school district that's pivoted to the new normal uh, almost seamlessly. And when you, Mitch covers what they're up to, their network design, you're gonna see a lot of parallels to large organizations, distributed organizations, and a pretty amazing story. And so we'll talk about the loud and Pal public schools, about their network design, and you know, Cervanon obviously weighing in from Cisco as well on the design, the tr remote troubleshooting, uh, he'll talk about, both of them will talk about the Cisco app hosting integration, and then Cervanon will even share um, some insight into the future roadmap. And we'll try to get through this relatively quickly so that you can have that Q&A with the, you know, the experts that, you know, you just don't get very often and uh, have them add a lot more insight based on your questions. So, um, Mitch, uh, could you kick us off and just tell us about um, this very, very remarkable school district? Sure. Uh, uh, my name is Mitch. I'm lead communications engineer for Loudoun County Public Schools in Northern Virginia. Um, we have a pretty diverse uh, county um, as far as demographics as well as ge geography, which we'll talk about here in a, in a little bit. Um, we're very large. We're, we're one of the fastest growing districts in the United States right now. Um, we, I've been here since 2014, and we've built at least one school since every year since then, um, sometimes two. Um, and even with what's going on right now with COVID, it, it, hasn't, it hasn't stopped any of that. Um, we got a brand new high school that's opening or was supposed to open for in-class students this, this summer or this fall, um, but obviously it's, it's empty. Um, right now, uh, yeah, we've got. I think I think the number is actually over eighty thousand students now, um, and over just over a hundred sites that we cover um, in in total. Um, so obviously, being as where we are in in uh, Northern Virginia, um, we're kind of in the. And Greg might uh, allude to this later. We're kind of in the middle of. Uh, data center central. The cloud lives right here in this county. Um, there are data centers everywhere. They're, they pop up like it's, it's weird driving from site to site. Sometimes you see new construction and you're like, I've never seen that data center there before. It happens that quickly. Um, but with that said, um, being, being as large as we are, you know, there are challenges and we have to rely on on tools uh, such as NetBees and we use Cisco um, to, uh, to meet the needs of, of the students and the staff members here. And even more so now, even though the schools aren't filled with staff right now, there are some staff, even though they're not filled with students and teachers for the most part, um, the, the service level still has to be maintained at a very high level. And uh, so far we're doing pretty good with that. Um, of course, it, the it's very dynamic right now. Everybody knows that things can change minute to minute. So, and, and we have to do that type of thing. We had to do that not too long ago. Um, but back in the springtime, we had to quickly, you know, prepare our network for um, lots more uh, virtual or uh, VPN connections. I mean, we had to do it basically overnight. Um, and the team that, that I'm on, we're a team of six. And uh, so, you know, we're, I don't want to say we're stretched thin. We're, we're pretty good. Of course, we could have a few more. <laughs> it would be nice, but um, we get the job done when we're pretty proud of that. Um, but yeah, we, we were able to, you know, shift um, to a somewhat virtual um, learning model pretty easily. I, I, 
pretty easily back in the spring. So, uh, yeah, it, it went pretty good. Of course, there was bumps here and there, but I don't think anybody was immune to that uh, when that happened back in March. So, um, yeah, we're, we're, we're doing pretty good with what we've got. Um, we're very fortunate. We're, uh, we have good leadership here. Um, and it's fun to serve the students because as Greg has written in some of these posts or uh, Stefano has written, uh, we've got a lot of tech savvy clientele that go to our school systems and their parents are, are the same um, being as though there, there's a lot of tech industry up here. So, and you know, um, and, being and, Mitch, and Mitch, you know, one of the things, I mean, what really came out loud and clear was the mix of students who could be very technically sophisticated because their parents are, in this industry and then you're right. serving areas where some of the you know chromebooks etc might be their first computers and so that, sure. that in itself it's awesome. yeah gives you some network design and considerations you know service consideration issues yeah so we in just a little bit of how loud it is it's 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 pretty cool like i said it's it's diverse demographically and geographically um, like towards the western end, it's very rural. So we run into the typical situations with rural, rural school districts where, um, you know, reliable high speed internet is a challenge. Um, and then, you know, as you get to the center, uh, Leesburg, uh, Ashburn area, you know, things are starting to be built up there. And then as you go east, of course, it gets closer to Fairfax, which obviously is built up. So it, it's a, it spans a very large gamut um, as far as uh, the clientele we serve and you know we've got obviously we've got lots of high-speed reliable internet for students to use at their homes right now and then we have some that have to rely on hotspots that are issued by us so it's you know it's ever like I said it's ever-changing so you know we, we have to be able to be nimble um, and leading into what we're getting ready to talk about that's why we rely on NetBees a lot for things like that. And I think what so, really stood out, Mitch, from the conversation and Sarah and I, I'll let you comment, but what really stood out was that, you know, before we chatted with you, we were thinking of this whole remote pivot is almost like a VPN story, right? And then yep. you said, no, well, actually, the core network is even more strategic because of this, and yeah. we have to have greater visibility in the network, and we have to understand it. So. Uh, Sarah and I, I'll let you weigh in, but, you know, as we look at the network diagram, maybe we can talk about how the network and monitoring became much more strategic for your ability to pivot. Sure. Right, so I was just wondering, so when you said, so they have 80K students uh, who are online and learning their, uh, you know, their, their materials and, and uh, you know, uh, just trying to imagine how is it for you to handle it, Mitch, the team and, and you, right? So you are leading this efforts, right? To manage the entire network of 80K plus students online. So wondering how do you do that? So it's, I'm, I'm not the only leader on this team. Um, we, it, our, our group, um, without going into a whole lot of detail, is kind of split between the data side and the voice side. But obviously, we all know the voice and the data are kind of coming together these days. Um, but uh, the group that I, you know, I'm, I'm with every day in, in this building where our office is, is, there's six of us and there's three leads and then there's three uh, engineers. Um, but in it goes without saying it does definitely have its challenges but obviously um you know having skilled uh employees has also a huge benefit but um but also being able to rely on the tools uh relying on the tools and reliable network equipment um so uh, as you can see from this diagram here which is a extremely high level diagram so there's there's this is just a basic breakout when when i put this slide together of one school site and this is part of a new um, topology that we're actually rolling out right now here in Loudoun County where we're putting in our own dark fiber. Um, it's been a project that's been going on all year. Um, I, I can't, I don't know how far along we're into it, but we're a good ways in and we're cutting sites over. That whole ring is complete at this point. So we are going to specifically rely on Catalyst 9500s in the core and then 9300s off of the core um, and then um, if it's not going to be these type of agents, we're going to be doing the ones that are app hosted um, in, in a situation in that little called out area. You can see right there that blue called out area where it says school. That's typically how a school will look. This is again high level where we have a 9500 as a core 
and then 9300s hang off of that in the IDFs. Um, and then the idea will be um, to um, deploy, and in fact, we've got 12 of them right now, 12 of them deployed um, across the district, mainly in our MDFs in a 9300, um, so that we can monitor the networks at these sites. And even though, like I was saying, there's very limited staff at these sites right now, however, there are services still being provided by the county through these sites. So it's still extremely critical at this point that these network services stay up. You, you know, some people might think, you know, oh, we don't need to worry about that right now. There's no kids. There's no teachers. They got, you know, a principal there. We'll get, we'll go over and fix that closet later. No, we have to make sure these services stay up because there's little tech, uh, like where they can bring in their Chromebooks to get fixed um, at certain sites. There's I've heard of meal distribution at some of these sites for um, for um, for for students that have come in and get you know that might need a school lunch. Um, you know they they have to rely on network services even if there's technically no staff in these buildings. So they're just as important now as they were before. So and and we look at it that way. We can't even though things are different, we're still going full force. So again, we still have to rely on these tools and now being able to do this by putting the, the NEPI's agent into the Cisco switches is just phenomenal. And that's a great you know, segue, right, to the whole remote troubleshooting challenge where just simply knowing the device status really isn't enough for what you guys right. are charged with. Absolutely. So Absolutely. You know, it, it, it's useful to know, but it's not, you know, the user experience for you is much more meaningful and sure issue. i mean we we are all familiar with other vendors that you know provide you alerts um whether something is up or down and that's great and that's important but however you know i need we need to know like what what is the bandwidth you know between these sites what's going on here what does this look like from the client perspective over at that high school um, they're, you know, doing um, uh, a troubleshooting help desk over there for Chromebooks and they're experiencing an issue. You know, I need to know, is this a problem in the WAN or, you know, what, what is it? And having the ability to deploy an agent like this offsite like that containerized um, game changer. I mean, you guys have heard me say that before when we've spoken before this and it really is a game changer and it, it's, and being able to leverage that type of power and a piece of equipment that we already have is, is outstanding. And I remember, Mitch, you telling us when we were preparing about your ability to deploy a whole lot of sensors inside an hour. And when you think about sure. the demands of a classroom, right, and 80,000 people being online, you know, minutes count, hours count in terms of your ability to diagnose a problem. And if you can deploy a sensor in 10 or 15 minutes in a remote area, um, that's a pretty powerful Absolutely. capability. I mean, even in the traditional setting, when, when students are in the classroom, they heavily uh, rely on uh, um, wireless devices, um, more so wireless, but of course there's an occasional wired, I guess. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's critical. And at any given time, at any, in any given classroom, I need to plan for, you know, upwards 30 to 60, maybe 70 wireless devices. Now, that's a challenge in itself. So, I mean, I primarily on a day-to-day -day deal with uh, mostly Wi-Fi stuff. Um, but obviously now that we don't have many, you know, many staff members in here, the Wi-Fi is being underutilized uh, for once. But yeah, I need to be able to figure out very quickly how that's happened or if there's an issue occurring because instruction then suffers and then the teacher is frustrated and we don't want that. We want to be able to get in do what the teacher's lesson is, get it done, and then have the students, you know, get what they need and go through class and, and have it go flawless. They shouldn't even have to think about the Wi-Fi or, or the network. It should just be there. Yep, yep. Uh, Sarah, on any comments? At right, so uh, I was just uh, uh, really, uh, you know, uh, closely watching what exactly Mitch was saying. So even when we are preparing, so, he was he was so uh, happy to see how exactly the sen the sensor is getting integrated to the cat and k right so uh, it's really happy to see that it's it's helping a lot uh, that they are able to maintain such a big network given the current uh, uh, pandemic situation and when
they are able to deploy the sensors, multiple sensors at multiple such remote locations with just a few minutes. But that's exactly what we are trying to solve for our customers. So uh, glad to see that that's helping uh, the LCPS team. And uh, you know, definitely would like to hear more from you, Mitch. So, so how is it uh, solving your problem day in, day out? So can you explain us more? Sure. Um, yeah, and just to elaborate a little bit on that, how, how easy it was. Of course, like the first one, you kind of stumble your way through trying to figure, cut, figuring it out. But after that, I mean, I, I rolled out, I can't remember, I know we wrote about it in the blog, but it, I was able to roll out agents on a pretty quick basis. Um, but being able to leverage that, and, and I said it before, but being able to leverage the power of the NetBees, and I've been NetBees user for several years now, um, into equipment that we've already invested in. So that, that's huge. And so I've got all the power in the NetBees now in equipment that I, I have in, in my network. So, you know, I'm, I'm looking at things uh, specifically in, in my case, I, I've got it up over here and I'll just look at some of the targets. But like, um, for instance, you know, we want to monitor web ser or DNS servers because um, obviously that's obviously pretty important. So we, you know, we monitor DNS servers um, from around the county because, you know, just because the centralized DNS servers are working well for one section of county doesn't necessarily mean, you know, we have to maybe troubleshoot that. Maybe there's a WAN link with some congestion or there's some kind of failure. Um, we monitor a lot of the um, external resources because obviously a lot of things, all the resources are, a lot of the resources we use are in the cloud now. So there's a lot of stuff out there. So we have to monitor make sure that you know um, these external web services are reachable whether it's via https or or however and that that we have a bunch of um, targets set up to monitor common ones that we use um, we also monitor internal web services um, just to make sure some of our internal web services that actually are in in our data centers are available you know we we just monitor things like um, just latency see make sure everything's looking good uh, we all we will uh, also test uh, in Perf, um, let me bring that up real quick so I can tell you accurately. You know, we can do um, iPerf between data centers and um, the, the, the sites around the, the fiber optic ring just to make sure our ring's in good health. Uh, and we have that set up to go, it looks like every, every 10 minutes, um, staggered of course. Um, just so we, we have a good idea what the, what the WAN's looking like at any given time. I mean, sure, we got a 100 gig uh, ring, but yeah, that sounds like a lot, but it's the old adage, you know, the more you give, the more they'll use. So um, it's super important to just be, make sure that the network is, is as reliable as it can be. And if something does happen, that we can be uh, quick to it, you know, um, Loudoun County is a very large county. So, you know, and there's six of us, so it could potentially take one of us um, we're, right now where I'm sitting is on the extreme western end of the county. If we need to get to the extreme eastern end of the county, you know, we're talking maybe 45 minutes. So 45 minutes is the whole class period sometimes. Yeah. So, you know, you, when you're losing that type of instruction time, that's not good. So if I'm able to leverage all of the power in these, um, in these bees with the equipment that we have over at these sites, I mean, I'm saving tons of time. I'm gathering really tangible data that will then, you know, it might actually get me to my fix, but if it doesn't get me to my fix, it gets me that much closer. Or I can be like, hey, and reach out to another team and say, hey, can you look into some of your equipment or something like that? You know, it just gets us to that end goal a lot faster. And, and it's paying off big time. And, and I, I hope I'm not um, jumping ahead too far, but we really can't wait until we can get the agent into the 9500 so we actually have it within our fiber ring. Um, with with this new fiber ring that we're putting out there, which is complete at this point, I'm I'm very excited that we'll be able to hopefully put some of these agents in the ring so that I can just monitor just that portion because obviously that's the core of our network. So I'm really looking forward to that. And sorry if I let the cat out of the bag on that one, guys. But, no uh, pun intended, really right? Really, no pun intended. <laughs> right, right, right. I'm Did you super want to excited comment? about that. Did you want to comment any more on the integration, or can we? Go to the next slide. What do you guys think? So uh, I just have a surprise to you, Mitch, uh, when we talk about the roadmap about the 9500 enablement. So 
uh, we'll just park it till there. So uh, <laughs> I, I really like the way you, uh, you know, uh, explain how you're uh, deploying the sensors, right? So that's exactly what we are trying to deliver as a part of the app hosting solution on Cat and K, right? So how are you going to uh, deploy it even for such remote locations? And, you know, you don't have to worry about spending some extra budget on your uh, dedicated compute resource that you have to plug in to do all your routine tests, right? And then ensure right. how are you going to scale it? So, you know, the whole saying says that time saved is money earned. So in this case, time saved is a better schooling for, you know, a bunch of kids, right? So that's exactly right. what we are trying to solve. So, yeah, let's see what you've got beyond this. Yeah, that that's that's exactly right. I mean, it would... Uh, you know, not that I don't love these little guys, you know, around, but, you know, being able to put them into the switch and have them perform the same job is just, it's great. Um, you know, it just, it helps us integrate our tools um, into the infrastructure, which, which is just outstanding. Um, and being able to troubleshoot and gather that data from the client perspective. And that's what I've always liked about the NetBees is that it's really based around the client's perspective. Because at the end of the day, that's the person who's consuming your consumable. So, you know, those are the ones that you really got to worry about. So if somebody's having a bad experience, it, I think it's super important to gather that data. And a lot of times, and I've told this story a million times where, you know, we'll get a call, the Wi-Fi is not doing great in this classroom or whatever, and we get out there. And there, you know, the teacher would joke around and say, oh, you know, you're here now and it, it's working, of course, you know, and, and it, it's been working now for 30 minutes. And then, you know, we have no clue why that happened. So uh, what we did traditionally is where we would leave um, the traditional bees and now there's the, the newer ones here um, and we would leave it behind and have it gather the data that we need and then we could have the teacher reach out again directly to us and say hey the problem's happening now and i can get onto the netbees dashboard and really dig down in and see what is happening from the client's perspective which is the most important so that's what we really love about it and now that we're able to kind of extend these into our switching uh, I mean, I keep on saying it, but it really is a game changer. And in the ease of being able to do that, I mean, I th what, what did I tell you, Greg, there? I did five of them in, in, an, in hour, an hour. Across your remote. Yeah, yeah, that was that blew me away because you, you have to think about in a normal environment that, you know, if you could deploy one in a couple hours is not bad. But to be able to deploy that quickly and get the network effects, right, of feeds from multiple points, right? As soon as I got it online, you assign the targets and boom, you know, it, it's already doing the job. And to be honest, I can probably do it even faster now just because I'm more familiar with it. It's not, it's not a difficult process. Cisco did a really nice job, obviously. I'm no coder or anything like that. So, I mean, as far as how it's done, it's not that difficult. I went through some documentation. I was able to, you know, get to the end goal very easily. I talked to Stefano a few times and, you know, concerning getting the, the net bees in there and it was after that I was like okay no problem and then I was able to start cranking these deployments out yeah it's amazing hey Saravanan we're ready to let the cat out of the bag did you want to talk <laughs> a little bit about the roadmap exactly Greg yes so uh, so far today what we support uh, on the cat and case side on the app hosting story is uh, we support app hosting through the DNA center on the cat 9300s today and along with that we also support uh, the cold restart, the auto restart capability on the 9300s, what we call with one plus one redundancy, right? And along with that, we also introduced uh, the span capability, what we call as the port mirroring, right? So, uh, you know, customer today can do port mirroring. Let's say uh, they have some tra traffic coming in, some uh, export, and that can be read out to the app that's sitting behind uh, the switch, right? So let's say Mitch wants to monitor a particular traffic coming in about in a, in a uh, let's say port 10 and want to understand what's going wrong there or analyze what, what traffic they are there getting in that particular port, right? So that traffic can be completely mirrored to the app, the NetBees app that's sitting in the switch, right? So that's a capability we brought in so far till July uh, uh, 2020. And the span uh, capability is uh, what we call as uh, a limited availability feature. So moving on, what we are bringing in uh, for November release is that we are enabling 
the support for 240 GB variant of the SSD stick on the 9300s. And along with that, yes, the cat is out. Uh, we are also trying to roll out the app hosting feature on the 9500 family, which is due by March 2021. So, and along with that, uh, we are also trying to see uh, if we can bring in the app hosting on the internal flash. It's, it's still at the little early stages for us to uh, disclose anything here. And uh, we are also trying to bring in uh, the app hosting workflow through our DNA center. So uh, like Mitch mentioned, right? So maintaining a remote location or deploying the sensors at remote location as is made easy. So it's, it's made easy for us today through the Cisco DNA center, what we see as uh, you know, the single pane of glass for everyone to operate for any locations and you can deploy the sensors just by a few clicks, right? So we are scaling up the 9300 footprint to the 9300L and 9400 which you are planning to deliver in November, 2020. And, and looking beyond November, what we are trying to enable is uh, make app hosting work on our SDA fabric deployment as well. Uh, the go-to thing that we are trying to do as part of IBNG, what we call as the intent-based networking, right? And with that, we are trying to bring in the cold restart capability in our stack-wise virtual environment as well, which is the redundancy uh, beyond just one chassis, right? So you enable the stackwise virtual uh, with two systems uh, uh, in place and then you maintain them as one virtual system, right? So that's where we are trying to enable. And along with that, we are bringing in the app workflow on the Catalyst 9500 series and the 9600s. So uh, slowly the discussions have just started and, and definitely we will be there soon. Excellent, so officially the uh, cat is out of the bag. Yep. All right, guys. <laughs> so I have to ask our moderators here, Jess, uh, how are we looking for any, are there any questions? And we've got Mitch and Sarah on live. Um, if uh, you have any questions, uh, send them in now. Jess, if you could actually, uh, if you see any interesting questions, feel free to throw them out there to Mitch and Sarah on. Okay, uh, yeah, it looks like we only had one question so far, which we answered about what's the max, oh, that one we did not answer yet. We answered uh, which license is required on the Cisco Catalyst to enable the integration, which is the DNA advantage. And it looks like there is one other question here. Um, what's the max throughput that we can get on a Cisco 9500? Right, so uh, we have one gig as, as a limit today, even in the 9300s, uh, the same carries for the CAD 9500s as well. And uh, uh, we are at a very early stage where we can say whether we can get the complete one gig throughput or is there any, uh, you know, anything that might get in the throughput when we have to do some, uh, you know, encapsulation or something. So uh, we are expecting anywhere roughly around uh, 700 to 800 uh, megabytes uh, that we can do on the 9500s. How, Mitch, I've got a question for you and, I, and sorry to spring yeah. it on you right now live, but what's the, what's, what's the most interesting network monitoring challenge that you've addressed or solved over your years there? Anything kind of uh, uniquely challenging or difficult or relevant? Well, so the best story that I like to tell honestly is about when we first got the first agent right here. Um, and I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, Stefano, if he's going to chime in or not, but we, at one point, and you still might be able to do this, is you could build your own bees and then uh, you could get a, uh, you could put it in a, like a free trial hive or something like that. I can't, I can't remember specifically. And when I saw that, it was actually Lee Badman who led me to this, um, wired, at Wired Not on, on Twitter. And uh, so I decided that to get, I had a pie just like, I think it was the Raspberry Pi 2B is what this is. Um, and then um, the wireless card that was in it. And I was like, well, let's, let's try this out because, you know, it's always the Wi-Fi. Those, those who work in the Wi-Fi industry know that it's always the Wi-Fi. Um, and I was like, well, let's, let's try this out. This sounds like a really cool use case right here. So I, we built one up, you know, it looked just like this, had a big aggressive antenna off of a USB dongle, no big deal. Um, and then I, I think I even had it, U, a USB uh, battery pack on it. It was velcroed around. I have a picture floating around somewhere. But it, it looked fairly 
you know, if, if I found that in my classroom, I might be a little bit suspect. Like, what is this? Um, but I put it in uh, a classroom and uh, we left a little note on the antenna. It looked like a flag. It says, hello. It said, hello, I'm NetBees. I'm here monitoring your network. And we left it behind and we were able to gather a lot of good information out of that. Um, and that's what truly sold me on, on the bees. Um, that's, that's the one time when I built my own and, and forgive me if I'm mixing up the logistics of how that worked back then, <laughs> but, um, I, it was able to see, like I said before, from the client perspective, any issues that were occurring or weren't occurring, you know, and then we could differentiate and, and go forth from there. But that, that's the one story about NetBees that, that I enjoy telling because, it, number one, it was kind of fun to build. You know, I, I like little tools like this, um, especially the ones that are powerful and that can get you, you know, good data. Um, and and that, in that case, I was able to get good data um, from that classroom. And, and hopefully I didn't startle any teachers or students by that big aggressive antenna that was on there. Excellent, excellent. Stefano, did you want to comment at all? No, I wanted to confirm that yes, we supported uh, Raspberry Pi from the start uh, um, and uh, there is still the opportunity to do a trial or self-deployment to, to AI um, with the Raspberry Pi image. Yep. Uh, Jess, Thank you, Stephen. I couldn't, I couldn't remember for sure. <laughs> Thanks for clearing that up. Yes, yeah, do, we have, do we have any more questions? Um. It appears that we do not have any more questions at this time. Well, first, I want to thank, you know, Mitch and Saravanan for taking time out of their schedule. And uh, I really enjoyed chatting with both of you um, and loved your blog post from last week. Obviously, our blog and uh, stay tuned. If you have any additional questions that you didn't get to ask, you can always email us at info at uh, netbees.net. So, Thanks everybody for participating and uh, you know, we'll call it a wrap.